My name is Monique Sullivan, and I am the Continuous School Improvement Coordinator. Although I'm listed under ESCA, I work with the assessment team under Maine's Model of School Supports, which falls under several sections of the ESSA statute, specifically Title I, Section 1111, or 1111, and then also under Section uh, 1003. And Section 1111 is actually where the statute falls under Title I Part A and it talks about all the requirements um, for the state accountability system or school improvement. And then section 1003 is where the funding um, is talked about and how that funding is allocated for schools that are identified for school support. And how we do all that is outlined in Maine's model of school support or our state accountability plan. And listed on the slide is actually our some of our coaches, which you guys will all be getting an assigned coach a little bit later on, uh, but not today. So we have our mission and our vision and our strategic priorities for the Maine Department of Education. I'm not gonna spend any time going over those, but just wanna stress that this is the driving force behind all the work that we do at the Department of Education. And so today's objectives, I'm not sure we'll get all this in. I've tried, I've packed a lot in an hour and hopefully to give you guys some questions as well, time to ask questions. Um, so I'm hoping to get all of this done in about 30 minutes, maybe 45 if I need that much. Um, so you can ask some of your questions. So hopefully today we'll have a better understanding of how to access and review your school profile, understand requirements for small the small planning summer grant that you're going to be um, awarded and to establish a school leadership team, to start working on your comprehensive needs assessment, to plan some summer professional development, and then start getting work, start working on the grants and grants for me or federal grants management system. Also to understand some of the requirements for tier three or what we call CSI, which is what's written in the statute, it's comprehensive supports and improvement. Um, but in Maine, we call it tier three. Um, but in the statute, it's called CSI, um, and these are for the school improvement plans. I'm hoping we have time to talk about that, but if not, we definitely have another meeting scheduled for another Zoom meeting scheduled for May 30th. So hopefully any of the questions you have will definitely get answered then. Um, and hopefully you can learn how to access and review your school profile, have a little bit of a better idea of what your leadership team should look like um, and make up, and then hopefully start planning your some of your work for June, July, and August, and to start prepping for the 24-25 school year. So your school has been identified for tier three CSI supports, now what? So I wanna talk a little bit about the identification criteria, the cycle, and how you can exit. So first, Maine's model school support is run every year. We run the model every year, but identifications are only gonna be made every three years for uh, tier two or TS TSI, tier three CSI, and every six years for tier one or ATSI. Um, the next identification cycle will be the fall of 2027, but depending on a school's eligibility to exit a status, um, it may be able to exit or convert to a different status on an off cycle year. This doesn't really apply for um, schools that were identified for tier three supports this year, but I just wanted to let you know that that's what the model does include. So you may see some schools being um, exited um, or converting to another status before the fall of 2027, uh, but that could be how their status was, how they, their status, depending on their status. But it won't apply to any of the schools in this meeting. So um, to kind of do this very basically or in a basic form. So we're considering these schools to be cohort two, uh, tier three CSI schools. Um, all of these schools received were actually identified um, as tier three with no supports in FY22-23 because they were out, because you guys are outside of the 5% um, as determined in statute and Maine's model of school supports, our state accountability plan. So you all should have received a letter or your school or your superintendent should have received a letter back in May of 2023 stating that 
uh, school did meet the tier three identification criteria, but because they were outside of the 5%, then they were not going to be giving their tier three, but tier three without supports. Um, and to meet the tier three identification criteria, all your student populations are experiencing challenges across all the indicators. And I'll explain what that looks like. I have some graphics on a couple of next slides. So fast forward to FY23-24, you were now identified as tier three with supports in FY23 because um, the school is still meeting the tier three identification criteria, and that's what we're counting as the 5%. So any school that was identified as tier three in 2020 and 2223 without supports, and if those schools were still meeting the tier three criteria, identification criteria in 23-24, then they were now going to be giving, uh, be identified with supports. They're gonna still be tier three, but now they're gonna be provided for tier for supports, and it's gonna be counted as the 5%. So you may see some, there's maybe some other schools that are identified for tier three, but they're in their first year. And so they're outside of the 5%. And so they won't be receiving the supports. I do have a little um, a little mark there, a little footnote to let you know that um, typically we would not make identifications two years in a row because we made identifications last year and we're making them again this year. Typically we wouldn't do that but the feds would not allow us to exit anybody last year and they wouldn't allow us not to identify this year. Um, and so hopefully we're gonna use this year as the like the baseline for the identification year and there shouldn't be identifications again for another three years, which would be fall of 2027. Um, so we're gonna make the identifications in the fourth year uh, and uh, hopefully that will clear that up um, so we can get that, that cycle cleared up and start working on a real three-year cycle. So you will be identified for three years. Um, your ability to exit in the fall of, 20, of 2027 if all criteria are met, exit criteria are met. Uh, you will be given a CSI or tier three, um, so part of your tier three supports will be a school leadership coach and section 1003 SIG funds, which I mentioned a little earlier. This is a part of the statute which actually um, talks about how much money has to be or how like a percentage of the Title I funds have to go to school improvement. And then uh, the strategic plan and SIG application, uh, which we'll touch upon today, but we'll spend more time on that um, at the next meeting on May 30. So school profiles in the letter that everyone got, um, you were given an email, so you were given a, uh, a web, a link to a web page that we set up for schools to be able to review their school profiles. All the school profiles would will, are available on the um, ESSA dashboard, which is under Maine's model of school supports. Currently what's sitting on the ESSA dashboard is last year's school profiles. So it's the school profiles for 22-23, which include, which is using 21-22 data. Uh, we have not put, we have not moved over the 23, 24 school profiles over to the ESSA dashboard yet. We wanted to give our identified schools a few weeks to try and look at that data before it gets um, moved over to the, to this Maine's model school support. So that should be happening probably by the end of this month, um, or hopefully, probably by the end, yeah, probably by May, yeah, May 30th, hopefully. We'll be moving, we'll, we'll be updating the um, the school profiles to reflect um, the 23-24 school profile. So uh, this slide is very highly um, annotated, um, but I wanted to try to explain to you what it means when all student populations are experiencing challenges. And you really wanna look down at the formula or kind of that formula down at the bottom there of the school profile. Um, and you want to look down and you want to also want to look across. And so you see the blue and you see um, you see the check marks and you see the um, the the triangles. So you're like, wow, how did I get identified? Well, it's because if you see so in ELA, this school did, you know, OK in some areas, uh, but over in um, in math, every single uh, student, student population um, was uh, ex experiencing challenges um, in 23-24.
And if you go down to the formula down here, it's and, so it's the chronic absenteeism and um, it's, you know, the um, progress and the achievement. So if we were just basing it on this section, they would not have qualified, but it's or. And so the uh, math is um, what made this school get identified for tier three supports because every single student population is ch experiencing challenges in, um, in math. And this is gonna look a little different for every school depending on your student populations. Um, and so it won't look the same for everyone. I'm so sorry for the delay. Okay, Hi, Monique. Glad, you're, glad you're able to oh, join us. Wow, there's lots of people there. <laughs> yeah, there's lots of people, yep. Um, and then that was an elementary one, but I also wanted to show you an example of a, of a high school one. I think this actually might be a K, like a mixed school, I think. And you, have to, you only get one profile. So say you're a K-12 school or you're a 7-12 um, school, you're only going to get one school profile. It's just going to have all these different data pieces to it. And if you also notice, this one has an English language proficiency. The, lot of, the other one didn't because there weren't enough students to merit that. So it really does depend on the student populations and it depends on your grade levels and your spans. The way the school profile works is um, it's like it can be a pre-K. We do pre-K and we do um, 912. But if your school is a combination of those, then your school profile will show that as well. It's all really based on your um, on your school ID. And so whatever your school ID is, and then we do have to break it up into pre-K uh, pre and uh, 912, and that's, that's required by the statute. So here you can see that there are some check marks, um, but there, this particular um, school, again, was uh, qualified because all the student populations are experiencing challenges in math. And then um, the school did not meet um, their uh, graduation rate. So this is a school that has both. Um, and they can, and you got to look down again, because it's chronic absenteeism and progress um, ELA. And then it's the ELA, um, sorry, English language proficiency. And then it's also the English, um, the ELA for the and, so they wouldn't have met it for this piece, but if you keep going or, and so for example, um, the high school wouldn't have qualified if the graduation rate had not, had been um, not in the red, not been challenging. So when you guys get assigned your school coaches, your school coaches can also help you go through this data as well. In addition, we added this this year um, so if you go, I didn't circle it up here, I apologize, but when you go to your school profile, you'll have four, you'll have four little tabs. And um, the tab is, the first one is the school profile, which I just showed you. And then the next one is the end count, which will tell you, for example, like how many students uh, participated in that assessment and across the student populations. Uh, the next graph, the next one is the graphs. If you want to look at some graphs and really easily see what um, maybe there's what area, what student populations um, are sh showing more challenges than others. And then the last one is, is very new. Um, we added this uh, for achievement goals so that you can look at this and look at it longitudinally, like, okay, where do I need to be each year? So when the fall of 27 rolls around, uh, if I'm, I'm on this right trajectory, then I should be able to exit tier three status. Now, I know there's some questions about this. Um, 23 is the baseline year and 23 is the score. Um, these were all based on state averages because we needed to have a baseline. Starting from 24 on, this is going to be based on a school's individual data. So it's gonna be different for everyone because it's gonna be based on your current date. It's gonna be based on your, your 23 data. So that's it's going it, to some of the numbers don't actually kind of align but they will because it's all going to be different based on your school so if you can meet these um, goals or these percentages then you should be right on target to be able to exit um, in the fall of 27. and um i think let's go back a second yeah i just wanted to stress too that i didn't put the slide in here and i apologize because i was trying to keep this but if you click on the i right here 
it actually gives you a whole definition of what all the indicators mean and what like what merits an um what merits um not met or let me what merits not met, what, what merits met, what what will um, trigger a developing, what will trigger an emerging, all that is in this. And um, if you click on that, it will it has all these definitions for it. And then if you click on the PDF, that'll actually, if you want to print a copy of this, you can do that in a PDF format. I think, are there any questions about the school profiles? Um, next steps. So I think in the letter, I kind of tried to explain it to schools that we understand that these identifications were kind of made a little bit later. The hope was to make identifications in the fall of 2024. For a variety of reasons, we were not able to make that. Typically, identifications are made in October or November of the year. Uh, and we just didn't make that date. So keeping that in mind, we said we wanted to be able to uh, have our identified schools, uh, the you know, initially identified this year or identified with supports to have some funds to be able to do some planning over the summer and some work over the summer. And then additional funds will be given to uh, schools uh, probably, hopefully by the end of June or the middle of June, the rest of the funding will get put in, will get um, uploaded to the applications. And the summer planning really is designed for, um, well, first of all, the summer planning uh, grant, it's a small grant and was based on student enrollment and just that's only three months of work. So we looked at the student enrollment and we thought about what activities do some professional learning, maybe have your leadership team meet. Um, and it really is to set up your begin operations of your leadership team to complete, start working on a school needs assessment and to start creating a school improvement plan. Um, and then the remaining funds will be awarded later on in the summer. And that, that formula is based on a set forth uh, formula that's in the state accountability plan. Um, and that's based on student enrollment, the number of economically disadvantaged students. Um, there is a factor in there for a small schools. So it's all calculated, but there is a baseline and everybody gets a baseline of 20,000 and then it gets built on uh, based on those other factors. And again, you guys are considered cohort two because you were originally identified as tier three and 22, 23. And we're, we're cohort one is 18, 19. That was when we made our first identifications under this model. And our second identifications were made in 22, 23. And that's a more than a three year difference, but it's because uh, COVID happened. And then we um, main, uh, changed the assessment system and we went to a different assessment system. Uh, Jenny, I'll get to your question in a second. Let's see what's in the chat there. Okay, so once you kind of know where the, the funding is, um, you want to really think about your leadership team. Get that set up. That's an integral part of this work. Uh, the school improvement um, philosophy methodology is all about building capacity of leadership teams and having shared leadership. So all this work shouldn't just fall on the principal. It should be shared leadership. It should be shared with your leadership team. And so um, the leadership team should, a, her statute should include, um, not leadership team, but the development of the plan should include your principal, other leaders, teachers, parents. Um, so you wanna get that set up. You wanna think about your meeting dates and work to be completed over the summer. You don't need to worry about next year because you'll have time to work on that, but this is just now to start thinking about the work you wanna do over the summer. Review your roles and responsibilities of your leadership team, and then um, review wise ways indicator ID08. It's really good about um, explaining uh, the role of the leadership team. And we do make a lot of references to the wise ways, Darago Star. Um, we don't require schools to use Darago Star, but we do use uh, a lot of their resources. And then there's just more, you know, uh, during the year, there are some expectations for leadership teams, just to put that out there. Um, but for this summer, that what we're doing right now is just thinking about the summer. That was three months, June, July, and August. And then in September, um, you will, you'll have, you'll update your 
school improvement plan to reflect the additional funds. So Jenny asked, would any unspent summer funds carry over into the school year? Um, so I'm not, I, I might need clarity on that or more, um, a little bit clarity on that question, but school improvement funds are awarded for one year. Um, and it's always in the second year of the funding year. So it's kind of bizarre because, so you'll be getting FY25, it'll be called FY25 SIG money or SIG application or SIG funds, but it's actually FY24 money. And so, um, actually, yeah, it's FY24 money. So that money, we're in the second year of that money. So that money will expire on 930 of 2025. And so we're always usually ESEA money or Title I money and get two years, but SIG money is always the second year um, behind that. So to answer your question, yeah, there's no carryover period for um, for SIG money. It's at, there isn't at this point. It just it just keeps going until that period of allowability runs out or you exit. So this year we actually have um, 30, we have 20, I can't remember exactly. We have about um, 26 schools that are exiting tier three status. And so they will not be able to use their money after 930 of 2024. They cannot, they're no longer going to, we're going to allow them to finish it out, but they won't be able to use it after 930 because they've exited, they're going to, they're exited tier three status. Um, so they won't have those funds anymore. So it really does depend also on your status. A question about on May 30th, how will the DOE be communicating this to the public? Um, we're just going to move it over. We're not, we're not making a, we're not making a public announcement. It's just going to be updated on the ESSA dashboard. And then step three, really start thinking about, um, plan, you know, plan your SIG grant money. I know you don't know exactly how much money you have, but, uh, we're hoping to have the FY25 SIG application ready for the schools that what we're calling the cohort um, two identified for school supports, yeah, tier three with supports. Hopefully the FY25 SIG application will be ready next week. You'll get a notice through Grants for Me when it's ready. You will only have that small planning grant in there. You won't have your entire allocation. It'll just be the small planning grant for the summer to help work on LT meetings and agendas, uh, thinking about, do you wanna attend the main DOE annual summit? You could use this, some of the funding for that. Um, and then how you want to work with your staff, you know, pay your staff to come in, whatever, you know, your collective bargaining agreement um, allows, and you can pay them. So these funds really are to pay for leadership teams to meet, to pay to attend, you know, the annual the DOE summit. We are actually going to be having a session um, uh, at, the at the summit where we're going to, hopefully, you'll be able to get um, your FY25 SIG application ready so you can get substantial approval for it. So you'll get a head start on it. Uh, we have a session planned for that. Um, so I think, and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the grants for me. Um, I don't want to get too much in the weeds, but I wanted you, once you get that notification, hopefully next week, that's our plan. I think Monday or Tuesday to get that ready for you. It'll be set up for you. Um, I wanted to let I wanted to walk you through because when you see the application to be like, oh my gosh, there's lots of pieces to this. But what we're trying to do is just, I want to get ahead of myself here. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself, so I'm going to stop. <laughs> um, and there is a question in the chat. It says, how many schools have been identified as tier three for cohort two? Um, we haven't uh, made that announcement yet, but, and um, so, Initially for tier three, actually, I don't even, I don't think I know all the numbers, but um, there are 16 schools that were cohort, that were tier three last year that did not get support. And there are 16 schools that are still tier three and they're getting, the, that's the 16 that are getting the tier three support. Um, that's what this, this uh, Zoom uh, webinar is for. Plus our plan says we have to support feeder schools. So we have two feeder schools. So we have a total of 18. But that's in addition to, that's cohort, that's, that's addition to the cohort. So we still have some tier three schools in previous cohorts that'll be getting, continue to get tier three supports. Um, so it's, it's, it's multiple years in a list. Um,
So if you hold off on the question about the support or the um, different access that school principals will have, um, hopefully I'll get that question answered. So um, step four, and this is part of the conduct, you know, you want to conduct a comprehensive needs assessment. And I just said that some of you may already be school-wide, some of you may already be operating a Title I school-wide program. Uh, most of you probably are. If you're elementary, probably most definitely. So you can use um, the template that's provided by the main DOE. Uh, we have a CNA template. Um, if you already, if your school already has a school-wide plan, um, you can start working with that. Now keep in mind, the comprehensive needs assessment is um, in addition to the SIG application. So you still have to do the comprehensive needs assessment, but you still have to complete the application. So, and we do ask that you upload your school-wide plan to the application as a document, but we'll get more into that as we get, um, when we start talking about the actual um, FY25 SIG application for, um, for the FY24-25 school year. Trying to keep it simple, but it might be more complicated. Um, and then you just want to make sure that if you do use this, the template or you do use a previous plan that you have, if you have a school-wide plan already in place, you want to make sure that you connect all the data and areas for school improvement to mean state accountability system, system, not systems, specifically to the areas that render the tier three of its CSI status. So um, what I did was I created a, a crosswalk where I took this tier three CSI application and I crosswalked it with uh, the school-wide uh, CNA template that we provide at the department. And then also with the ESCA consolidated application um, so that um, we've heard that a lot of principals like, oh my gosh, now I gotta create a whole new plan. I gotta do all this work. But actually, if you have a school-wide plan already in place, you should just be able to pull pieces down from that uh, because your base plan should really be that school-wide plan. You shouldn't have to create something new. Unless you don't have a plan, then you're going to be starting from scratch. But if you already have a plan, you should be fine. And technically, you all should have a plan because um, these requirements were actually in place last year. And so uh, hopefully you do that. But And then here's just a screenshot of what the CNA crosswalk looks like. But I will put that link in the chat for you guys. Hopefully, I'll do it before the end of the meeting. Um, or maybe I will do it right now. So I'll do it. I'll do it by the end. Or I'll make sure what I'll do is um, when the FY25 application comes online, then I'll be able to send you guys notifications through grants for me. And usually what I'll do is I send, I'll send the recording. And once it gets uploaded to uh, YouTube, I'll send that recording. I'll also send a copy of the slide and any other kinds of documentations or links that you need, I send that through grants for me. So grants for me, I know that the letter, I sent it out to the ESA coordinators as well. I did that intentionally because a lot of our ESA coordinators have a lot of experience with grants for me and they'll be able to help navigate through that, through the system. And I did try to do this as basically as possible in a very, very basic form. So I'm probably skipping over a lot of pieces, but I wanted you to get a hat to be able to start when um, when you get notified notified that the application is ready. So again, rather than you have a planning grant and then you have the FY25 SIG application, we decided just to use the FY25 application, but you're only going to do certain pieces of it for the planning grant, and then you're going to go back and fill in the rest when you get your additional funds to for the FY24-25 school year. So when you open it up, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, there's all these pieces. But really all you're gonna do is you're gonna fill out section one. And I, I have screenshots of this too. I just thought I would put it all on one page first. But you're going to have, you're gonna do section one. Then you're gonna do part of section two. You're gonna do part of section three. And you're gonna do part of section four. Um, and then you'll come back, you'll do that just for the summer for three months for that summer planning. And then you'll come back and you'll update it for your 24, 25 school year. And we are going to have another Zoom meeting on May 30th, where we'll try to get more into detail about the FY25 SIG application. And then we do have a session that we're offering, like I said, at the annual summit that hopefully that'll give you um, more information as well. Um, I just wanted like a one page. So 
for section one, you're just going to put who your um, leadership team uh, members are, um, and then describe how they were how they were selected. Section two, you're just going to talk. You're going to put your meeting dates, start and time, and end dates, and purpose of the meeting just for June, July, and August. Um, and then section three, you're just you're going to leave a lot of areas blank, or just put. And I'll tell you why you have to put TBD in there, um, or TBA, or whatever you'd like to put in there. Uh, but you only fill out like just the part that's related to uh, your the work you're going to do over the summer. And then in your budget, you're just going to include the cost for those activities that are going to be over the summer. Um, and then just to know that all required sections will need to be completed and updated for the substantial approval and final approval um, when the rest of the funds are added in there. So to start off with, um, you would go to the login on the Grants for Me or the ESCA website. Um, you'll go through this. Hopefully, this is where I would suggest you connect with your ESCA coordinator because they can really help you through this piece. They all have to do this with the ESA Consolidate app, so they can really help you. So use them as a resource. They all got the letter notification, so hopefully they can help you with that. Um, and then talking about user access, whoever is the LEA authorized um, um, user should be able to set all the principles up with, um, it'll be school application um, director status. And then that person will be able to uh, do all the work in the application. We do suggest that you probably put a couple people in there um, so that it's not solely reliant on the principal to do. Like I always say, the principal leads the work, but does not do all the work. And then um, this is when you'll put in your your um, who your stakeholders are. You don't need you only need to fill out the green part, the the full name, title, and then how they were selected. You're going to leave the fourth column or the one I have in yellow. You're going to leave that blank. And then you'll come back and fill that in later when you are for the rest of your plan for the FY24-25 school year, when the rest of the funds are awarded. Um, and then, so after that, in the same like section, you'll see um, leadership team meetings. And you typically would put all your leadership team meetings for the year, you need to map those out. But for this small planning grant, you're just going to put your meeting dates for your leadership team for June, July, and August. And then you'll come back and fill those in for the remainder of the year for the rest of your funding um, when we get ready to set that up. So you'll just keep your summer dates and then add your new school year meeting dates. Um, and then section two, this is where the strategic plan is. And I apologize, I tried to make this as simple as possible, but you're gonna open this up at section three, uh, sorry, it's section, yeah, it's actually section two, not section three, but yeah, it's section three, but I'll fix that. Um, and I should have, I apologize, I should have gotten a screenshot of the whole thing, but I was trying to keep my slides um, at a minimum. Um, you're gonna see a bunch of different sections here. You're gonna see one that says, significant strengths, growth, and resource areas. You can leave all that. You can just, you can't leave it blank because if you notice there's a little asterisk here, an asterisk means you need to put something in there or you won't be able to submit it. And that's a software issue. Um, and it's us trying to utilize what we already have versus having you guys have two different applications. We're just gonna utilize what we already have. So you will need to put something in here and I've just got put TBA, put TBD. Um, and just put something in all those boxes, even if it's just NA, that's fine too. Um, and then you will do that again for the root cause analysis, um, because if you don't, they they won't you won't be able to submit your application. So you need to put something in those boxes that have a little asterisk next to them. But it's not really relevant. You don't need it for the summer um, grant for the planning grant. And then again, you're going to have where you're going to, it's called a strategic plan and you're gonna, it's gonna be a cross like this. And you will need to fill out a SMART goal, but it can be something simple as FY25 summer SIG planning. It does not have to be, um, you know, a traditional SMART goal. It's just, to, it's a placeholder in here. And then 
You don't need to put anything for your resources or if you're evidence-based interventions at this point, you will need to list your activities that you're going to be doing um, over the summer. For example, if you're, I have next, I'll say see next slide. And then the rest, you can just put NA or TBD or something in there that will, because there's an asterisk next to that. Um, so, because I wouldn't, I don't want people to say, well, I can't turn it in. I'll be like, oh, because you didn't put something in this box. So just put something in there. And again, this is where your ESCA coordinator can really help because they're used to this, um, some of these little nuances of uh, grants for me. And like I said before, all these will need to be completed um, for the FY when all the additional funds are added and for the rest of the year and to get substantial and final approval. Um, and then some examples, I just wanted to throw some examples in there for this. So for this box here, some things you can think about putting in there, like L your leadership planning meetings to establish roles and responsibilities, leadership team meeting to review identification data, leadership team to conduct comprehensive needs assessment, attend main DOE summit. Um, you can put all that in there as activities. Um, but you want to make sure that whatever you put in your activities aligns with what you put in your budget. Um, so if you say in your budget, you say, um, we're going to go to the main DOE summit, but I go back to your activities and I don't see it listed. I'm going to say there's, you know, there's, you say it here, but you don't say it here. Um, there's a question. So there's a couple questions I can jump back. I'm going to, I'm going to finish this part and then I will go back to the questions in a second. And the last piece is the budget. So you will need to put in um, cost for those activities that you put in for the summer. And I just wanna make sure that uh, if a lot of, some principals don't have that much experience with actually budgeting and that kind of stuff. So they just, but if you do, then this is review for you. But if you don't, this is kind of some basics like salaries and benefits, they need to be separate. You can't put them all in the same um, cost. You need to put, salaries and then benefits need to be separated out. Um, purchase services needs to be a separate um, cost. Travel needs to be a separate cost. Um, and instructional supplies, SIG money is not for instructional supplies. It's not for student activities. It's um, for uh, the operation of a functional leadership team. And it's also um, to provide professional development for the, um, you look at your action steps and maybe we need responsive classroom training. So SIG money can pay for the training um, and that's, it's more of that professional learning. And a big part of that is because we're about building capacity. And um, when you exit, and if this, if you're relying on SIG money to provide programming, then that's not gonna be sustainable when you exit. So, but the professional learning will, because you'll have learned and you'll have gotten the training so you can continue on with that programming afterward. Um, and again, costs need to align with the action steps. Budget narrative needs to be brief, but does need to line back. So I don't want a novel, and I'll explain to you. I don't want a novel in the narrative because it takes longer. Um, se separate items if they're not related. Like don't put travel in the same with salaries. Um, and I know people will write up like a whole big thing about their PD. Um, if it's not really related, don't put literacy and PD and math in the same budget item. Keep it separate because it, it is easier. And then um, again, really use your ESC program coordinator as a, a resource because they are used to, to navigating the uh, Grants for Me platform. And then again, when I was saying for an example, so this is one budget item. So it's just talking about salaries. So it's salaries. Um, salaries do need to be broken up too. So um, if you have, you're gonna do two meetings in June, two meetings in July and two meetings in August, you say two meetings, two hours each, whatever your hourly rate is, and that's gonna be 10 staff that are gonna participate times six meetings, it'd be 480, that's just salaries. Then you'd have a separate um, item that would be the benefits. And then, um, and then let, so you'd have separate. And I didn't wanna make this too overburdensome, but you may have like four items. You may have four, four uh, budget items. You may have salaries, you may have benefits. Maybe you're going to the annual summit, so you'll have a travel, um, item and maybe you're going to do a book study over the summer and so you might have instructional supply it'll say instructional supplies but it'll be you need to buy the book so your your um your uh your um your team can read the book so that kind of thing but i'm gonna i think that is it for that part oh yeah and then approval 
So um, the approval, the way that works is you'll, when you're, when you get all those pieces done, you're going to go in and you'll change the status. And again, this is really, really helpful if you use your ESA coordinator because they're very familiar with this. Um, you will get, um, the approval will change to um, school improvement grant consultant approved. Um, and then the feedback will be provided in the consultant checklist and or history log. So if um, it doesn't get approved, then you'll want to look into the consultant checklist and that'll give you some feedback. Like you said you were going to the, you said you didn't mention the MDO, the annual summit in your um, action steps, but you did mention it in your budget. So you want to just make sure there's alignment. Now, I do want to stress that when you get the additional funds added in, it's going to change everybody's status. So it's going to force you to go in there and make the changes. But we can talk more about that um, in May. And again, I want to just stress that I know this isn't perfect. I know there's a kind of a, like it's not perfect. There's a lot of things that don't necessarily um, make sense. But we're trying to keep you guys from having to do to do two different plans. We want it just to all be built in the same and we want it just to be a continuous of the work. And that's why we're trying to just use the platform, the FY25 um, application platform. Oops, I, I paused, I thought I blocked that out. I will block that out before um, that. Let me go look at the questions here. So to get back to Teresa's question about the different levels of access, um, principals should really have, it should, it's called um, school improvement um, application director. And that means they can go in there and do all the editing and all that work. Um, there's also um, school improvement. Um, I can't remember exactly what the title is, but it's where they can also do some of the work. And then, yeah. And then you can give all of your, um, your leadership teams, you can give them all view status too. So they can't make changes to the application, but they'll be able to see everything that's in the application. They'll be able to see any comments, um, any feedback that's put in there. Um, so what is the SIG application due date? So this planning grant, there really is no due date for the planning grant. This is just to get you guys that funds, but there's no there's no due date for it. You don't have, to, I didn't, we didn't put a due date. Um, regarding the FY25, when the additional funds come in, um, you will need finance, you will need substantial approval for anything that's not tied to that SMART goal. You know, that's what I said, you want to have that SMART goal that says FY25 summer planning, uh, because that's going to tell me, okay, that's, we are going to get approval just for that. But then anything else, um, you will need substantial approval for that, for anything that happens, um, like from, you know, September or, you know, further on in the year. Typically that due date for the traditional FY, for the traditional SIG application is October, uh, I think it was October 30th last year. That's for like so a final approval. Substantial approval, we tell you do what you need to do as quickly as you can, because you don't want to be stuck where you can't, you can't um, get reimbursed for something because it was before the substantial approval date. So, um, and the application should hopefully be uh, ready with all, well, you guys will have access to your application, which is that small planning grant, but we're hoping to get all the allocations in and ready, uh, all the additional allocations in by July 1st. So hopefully you'll have access to that to plan it out. Um, and we'll talk more about what's required for substantial approval, but typically is to get all your leadership team meetings mapped out for the year, have your leadership team um, assigned, um, and mapped out, um, have your um, memo of understanding, which we will talk more about, um, uh, signed and um, approved. And then your a copy of your updated school or school improvement or school-wide plan or your CNA. Those are typical uh, um, substantial approval requirements. You don't need to have your budget done typically, and you don't need to have um, your strategic plan done typically. So it's just those two sections that need to be done usually, not the strategic plan, but the other two pieces. But we'll talk more about that on May 30th, uh, about what, what you'll need for substantial approval. 
If we have a feeder school, is it one app or do we do it together? It's two different apps for the, the two feeder schools. They won't, they're separate schools and they'll be given a separate allocation. So uh, yes, there, it's gonna be two separate um, um, applications. We're hoping to make the application, the FY25 application, um, at least with the small planning grant, we're hoping to have that ready by the beginning of next week. Our goal. Uh, will you be will be assigned a coach before we enter summer planning grant stage? Um, I'm hoping to have all the coaches assigned by July 1st, if not earlier. Yeah, so the next question is, can I assume summer planning funds can be utilized in part to pay for teaching staff who would be working beyond contract hours? Yes. You can use the SIG money to pay for your leadership team or professional learning that happens outside of contract hours. You, you can't, obviously you can't pay, if they're already getting paid through their contract, you can't use SIG money, but it would be outside of that. Is stipend allowable for leadership team work? We prefer, we don't really like stipends because um, stipends are typically paid at like certain times of the year, but, um, the work needs to be paid of like, we can't pay out work until it's completed. And this way it keeps track of that because for example, um, a lot of times stipends are, um, you get like $500 at the end of the year, but we don't know how much work was completed. We don't know how much time was completed. So that's why it needs to be done. Even if you have stipends, we tell districts to break it up like an hourly rate so that we have an idea of what that is. But we can talk more about that when we get to, um, you can reach out to me directly and we can talk more about that. Yes, um, will a feeder school have a coach? Yes. Um, typically we try to give the same coach per district. So we don't typically, we like if there's, um, you know, there's a more than one school that has a tier three uh, with support school, we'll try to give them the same coach typically. Now we've had a little bit of um, movement with our coaches. And so right now we do have some districts that have split coach or have different coaches, but that's just because we had, some coaches um, leave in the middle of the year. So we had to provide um, another person for them to support them, to support that school. And again, our, our haste in trying to doing this is to give you guys access to your funds as quickly as possible and to get you on the ground, to get you running as quickly as possible so that you can start um, the school year um, in end of August or September, whenever your school starts and you can hit the ground running and you're not spending, you know, September and October trying to get all this work done. Use the summer if you can to try to get a lot of that work done so you can just hit the ground running when your school starts in the fall or late summer, depending on when you start. Um, and then the last, I know I'm running, I knew this was going to happen, but I just wanted to let you guys know that a lot of the requirements that are in the application are not something that we just came up with. Uh, they are actually required in statute. And so this is section 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 111, which actually states all the parts that are supposed to be included um, in the plan. Um, so you can see that specific stakeholders, um, it needs to be tied back to the indicators that in the state accountability system, you need to use evidence-based interventions. There needs to be a school level needs assessment. You need to identify resource inequities. And we'll talk more about this um, and then like the school needs to prove it, the, the local educational agency, the SAU needs to prove it, and then the SCA, which would be on the DOE needs to prove it, and then it needs to be monitored. So uh, that's to give you guys a heads up. So a lot of times, why do we have to do all this work? Well, a lot of it's because it's required in statute. And then the last two, and this is section 103, which is where the money is assigned. And so there's some pieces of that, like if you are gonna hire a consultant, you know, make sure you look at D, look at your procurement policies. Um, and we can talk more about this. Um, and I just wanna let people know that in the past, um, school improvement money wasn't as monitored as probably it should have been, but it is gonna be a part of FY25 ESCA monitoring. So if your school district is selected to be uh, monitored for ESCA, then you will be, SIG funds will also be um, monitored. Now, I'm not sure, um, and so this is why I'm putting this in here, because all of these schools were identified for tier three supports in last year. And so 
I was trying to explain at the beginning, this is the part in the statute that anyone who identified has to do this work. This is the funding. So technically all of the tier three schools should have been doing this work last year. Um, and so that's why it's really important to get try to get that plan in place. And then that is it. Um, here's our resources page, um, professional development calendar. You can click on that. Our how to um, our contact information, and then um, how to stay connected with the DOE. And I think I'm going to stop record at that point, and I will continue to answer any questions that you have.